Thanks, Haley. Um, there we go. Um, thanks, Haley. So we'll wait for her to share her screen. But today we really want to focus on, you know, effective advocacy. And as, as Devin mentioned, we've broken it down. We can switch to the next slide. Um, we've broken it down into three different sections for everybody. There's understanding advocacy, um, an intro to the Ontario government, and then putting advocacy into action. You know, how, how do you, all the, everything we're talking about today, how do you actually um, um, make movement with it? So the first section, um, as you mentioned, is understanding advocacy. And we start out with an interesting, with a quote that, um, by Margaret Mead that says, never doubt a small group of concerned citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I, I think this is important because I, a lot of people think that there needs to be, you know, hundreds of thousands of people talking about an issue for it to make an impact. Um, it really doesn't. It's, it's how loud you are, not how big you are. And if an issue is important and you advocate in the right way, a small group could really um, make significant changes. So what is government advocacy? You know, it's an activity by an individual or a group which aims to influence decisions with political, economic, and social systems and institutions. So what does this all mean? How could it make a difference? It can make a difference because decision makers react to credible groups or individuals who really most effectively bring their their issues to the forefront of the government's agenda, you know, make it relatable to what the government is doing. And in the case of advocating to government, there's many competing interests and concerns. You know, every day, if you look in the media, you, you see many issues of regarding, you know, the provincial government and people calling on the provincial government to do certain things. So it can only be fulfilled when people make their voices heard. And, um, as taxpayers, as voters, you know, as organized groups like yourself, you can really have an ability to make ch effective change. So what do you advocate for? There's a few different things that um, organizations will advocate for or individuals. There's government funding, which groups often will engage with government to ask for funding for a sector, for areas, for infrastructure projects, or in the case for non-for-profit organizations and charity direct funding for the organization. Um, this is obvious, this is often involved during what is called pre-budget consultations. And what that means is, you know, the, the government releases its budget every year and ahead of that, they consult with different organizations on funding asks and what people are looking for in the budget. Um, and, and so that's really when this, that is really the timing of when government funding advocacy requests um, are um, really important. Then there's awareness efforts, which means that um, another, it's when an organization or not-for-profit charity is, um, wanna raise an issue about something and they really, um, you know, Success of this is when you can designate a awareness area, um, when people can spread, when you have the government spreading it, there's an awareness campaign, government actors have joined that campaign speaking in support for the organizations. And then there's um, preventing ne negative government action. And what this is, is really when during government consultations, if the government's considering um, doing something, there's an effort to prevent this from happening. You know, whether it's passing le legislation that has negative impacts on a business, organization, or groups, um, it's a type of advocacy that's very important. Um, if there's, if the government's doing something that a group feels that it would impact them in a harmful way, you really have to be a bit more aggressive to get the government to either amend a piece of legislation, change a policy decision. Um, and then the last one is legislative and regulatory or policy change. And that's really when 
an advocacy group, organization, individual is encouraging the government to make a change to policy. So rather than the one we were just talking about where the government is making a change and a group will, sees that as having a negative impact that they, so they want the government not to do that. In this case, it's groups really looking to encourage the government to act a policy change that would you know, have a positive impact on businesses, organizations, and people. So those are really the four different buckets that, um, of, of what you advocate for. So the next question really is, who is your audience? The, the government is a very large institution and you really need to figure out who to go, who to, go to, to to make it that you can see it, a change made. And so there's, in your case, there's the Minister of Health, as well as the Minister of Health's office, which is the political staff. Um, they are, they give political staff in the minister's office, give the minister advice, they, um, the, which then means they often give cabinet advice, they give other offices advice. They're very important, just as much as the minister. There's also MPPs. So with MPPs, you have, that local aspect that Devin was talking about early on. Um, MPPs really drive, um, they drive change in the sense uh, when it comes to being at the, the caucus table, if it's a conservative MPP, they can bring up an issue with their cabinet, with their, the ministers responsible with their other MPPs and with the premier himself. So from a local level, MPPs are very important when you wanna push an issue. Then you have other senior political staff. So the premier's office, so there's a very, um, it's a large office and there's very important people in that office that you wanna speak to, to ensure that your issue is heard. They are, are key decision makers. There's also, you know, minister, if it's a funding request, even though it may be health related, minister of finance is very important um, as well as treasury board. So it's just, it's going to the right people um, to help make decisions. And then on, on the non-political side, the bureaucratic side, there's the Ministry of Health staff, like the deputy minister, the asso assistant deputy minister or director, they also advise the minister's office and the minister, so they can really help push issues um, up the chain as well. And then in some cases, a decision may need further approvals from government leadership. So you really need to just keep an eye out on how your conversations are going and, and you know, who you may need to, what committees you maybe need to, to lobby and so forth. Um, and then also there's non-governmental organizations. Um, it's often, I often say that if you can get someone else talking about your issue, um, it's it's never a bad thing. It's always it's always good to have others raising those those issues as well. Um, so before we move on, do you have any questions just on the first few slides that we we mentioned? Um, yes, I do. So, for example, for the non governmental organizations, would you would you consider like would you say that um, they kind of serve as like allies in a way. Yeah, they can. Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, they absolutely can. They can also, it, it's also just, if you have important stakeholders to let them know, you know, what you're doing with government is also very important, but they could serve as allies as well. Um, you'll often see organizations, um, um, form what they call coalitions so they can, you know, have, have a louder voice. Um, Devin, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there, there's opportunities in some cases with government, with organizations. Now, because this is, um, you know, because of, of, you know, Skaggle being a patient advocacy uh, organization primarily, you know, you are thinking about, you know, are there allies with other patient groups? And certainly there's been efforts to work with Thalassemia Canada, and that's an obvious case. And, and there's, mm -hmm. there's in that case, there's opportunities to work together. In, in some cases, it may be about uh, managing relationships within what we call the broader public sector. So these would be those entities that aren't government, but are largely funded by the government. So thinking about hospitals, for example, or uh, school boards, um, universities, colleges, things like that. 
Uh, it may be, in some cases, other uh, nonprofit organizations where your main focus isn't about finding allies, but about managing reaction, right? So if you're advocating for something, do you want to, are you thinking about your audience in terms of, are, is this group going to react negatively to what we're mm -hmm. doing? How do we manage that so that we don't find out that the government is hearing from another group saying, if you do this, it's the worst thing ever, or don't do this, don't, don't do this, we have a better idea. So, you know, it's trying to keep in a sense of that whole uh, landscape or map of interested groups to see, you know, which are the groups maybe that are helping our effort, uh, which are the groups that uh, could be problematic for us that we need to manage, and which are those that we just need to be keeping engaged and informed because they may have something to contribute, or the government mm -hmm. may ask them uh, about anything uh, th that would be proposed before they do it. Um, so, Devin, I don't. I know we're keeping Actually, track of. Yeah, is there, there's a, few, a couple there of is, questions. There's a I couple see. of questions here. So I'll just read the questions, and then we'll Jess and I will kind of handle them as they come. Um, so, a question from Abby: uh, Given how government officials, uh, you know, at least elected officials, are elected in and out of office, how do you ensure all the advocacy effort you've put in with one government official doesn't go to waste if someone else takes over that office? Well, I, I know Jess will have some thoughts on this too. <laughs> that unfortunately is the reality of government relations. Uh, it's something that we deal with constantly uh, and it takes a lot of different forms. It, you know, you have obviously in the case of a majority government, you'll have elections every four years, in which case uh, MPPs, a significant number of MPPs could change depending on the outcome of the election. Uh, in a minority government, which is when no party has... Um, an absolute majority of the seats in the legislature, uh, the government can fall at any on any what they call confidence vote. So it's much more unstable and governments usually last about half as long. So more frequent elections. You also have the fact that the political staff uh, that work in the office change can change fairly frequently. A political staffer who's worked in an office for two to three years is, is been there a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, Ministers change regularly. We'll talk a little bit about this. The ministers that are selected to lead the ministries are shuffled, are changed by the premier, really at any point the premier so chooses, but you know, more realistically, probably a significant cabinet shuffle at least every two years, which could, could change a lot of the faces responsible for your files. And of course, the career civil servants, the ministry staff who are uh, members of the Ontario Public Service who aren't elected, but nevertheless have a lot of day-to-day -day, uh, impact on your issues, uh, they change too. You know, they pursue mm -hmm. new career opportunities, they may retire, they may move to other ministries, they may get promoted. So that's a long-winded way of saying that advocacy is a constant effort because you will regularly be finding that even as you make progress, something will change from a personnel perspective that will mean you will have to reintroduce your issue to them again and presume they don't know any of the background that the people before may have had years of experience working with you on. The positive of this <laughs> would be that if you can get issues past certain landmarks and there's no consistent answer to what those landmarks are, but move them along the process to certain stages that they begin to become the business of the government and thus you don't necessarily have to start from zero every time. Uh, you know, they may already be working on a policy change. The government may have already committed to do something. Um, perhaps something was committed to in an election platform or a private member's bill was introduced and there's legislation in front of the house. There's a lot of different things. We'll talk about some of them, but uh, yes, it is a constant effort. And I think that's a big part of why this session and others that we hopefully will, will, will share with you will be so important because your work will not occur once. It will be an ongoing effort and it will change. And, and it may change pretty dramatically at times for reasons uh, completely beyond your control. Yeah. And I just want to add that. And I think that's why it's important that your audiences is not, it's more than just one minister's office. It's the premier's office. It's, it's local MPPs because it can, even if there's a shuffle, a cabinet shuffle, you, you could still have allies already developed um, with those other audiences, as well as the opposition, which um, is also important getting close when you get, as you get closer to the election, making sure you have those relationships already with opposition 
um, MPPs and, and, and staff who will, who will be working on the campaign because as Devin said, they can um, form government. Now, the only other thing I wanted to add was that it's also a positive if you're not making traction, because sometimes it's hard to make traction with so many different demands, priorities, if you will, in a, in a minister's office, a shuffle can also be seen as a reset. And if in the case that you may not be getting the traction that you want, a new minister coming in um, could give new life to a file that you were maybe seeing, um, you were struggling with to, to get movement on. Okay, I think we can uh, continue. Uh, go ahead, uh, Haley. So we um, wanted to chat a little bit of kind of, you know, what is an MPP and how what the current makeup is in Ontario, of those MPPs. So MPPs is um, members of provincial parliament. Um, in other provinces, um, they're often called MLAs, um, which, but same thing. Um, Ontario has 124 MPPs, um, and they're from 124 ridings across the province. Um, it's the, in Ontario, you have kind of the makeup, you have 72 progressive conservative MPPs, which is, you know, how they form the majority government. The NDP is the, is what's known as the official opposition, um, as they have the next um, largest amount of um, MPPs with 40. The Liberals currently have eight MPPs, the Green Party has one, and then there's also three independents. So they currently don't have a um, party affiliation. So to get a majority, like the PCs do have um, 72, but technically you need 54 to have a majority. If, if um, you know, there, it's less than 54 MPPs, um, let's just say 48, um, if that would be considered a minority government. And so we wanted to touch upon before I moved on a bit of, um, you know, the term caucus, which is often referred to. So caucus is what is all of the elected members from a particular party. So you have the PC caucus, the NDP caucus, the Liberal caucus. Um, and then you have MPPs assign different roles. So they may not be on the government side, they may not be a minister, but they um, could be known as house leader, which runs the day-to-day -day legislative agenda for the government. Then the, the party whip, which is um, every, political, every caucus has a, um, a party whip, which they just make sure that, um, you know, people are there for votes, people are there for their house duty, that they're, their house duty, that they're, everything that's, they're supposed to, MPPs are supposed to be doing in the legislature, the, the whip just makes sure that everyone knows what's going on, knows when there's going to be a vote. Um, and also members who aren't assigned you know cabinet ministers or party whipped are often considered backbench mp backbencher mpps um, on the government side um, on the non-government side on the opposition side there's also critics which um, are assigned basically um to be the critic of the minister the ministry of health the critic of um, you know, finance, the critic of infrastructure. So the opposition also has their own policy file, opposition MPPs are also given their own policy files that they need to be following through, um, throughout um, each day at Queen's Park. So moving on, then we have the Premier. So the Premier is the head of provincial government and responsible for working with cabinet ministers to develop, develop um, policies, set priorities for the government. Um, the Premier is the leader of the party, which has, the, like we said, the most support in the legislature at the time. However, the Premier um, does not have to be technically serving in Parliament to be appointed Premier. Um, the Premier is chosen internally by the party um, with the most support court and the legislature and the premier must also run for election in a riding. So the premier, premier Ford is, um, you know, also an MPP. And so they um, should a premier step down or no longer be able to stay um, in in the role for whatever reason, 
the governing party will then select a new premier, and which we saw this with um, Premier McGuinty when he stepped down, there was the liberal leadership race, and that's how Kathleen Wynne originally became premier, and then she went on to win the following election. That's an important uh, thing just to note, which I'm sure you're all uh, largely aware of, uh, but as much as the premier in our elections becomes the focus of people's voting decision, uh, you of course don't vote for the premier in, uh, in Ontario, nor do you mm -hmm. in any other province, uh, nor do we vote for the prime minister, of course. Um, you vote for the local member and it's the accumulation of sufficient seats for a certain party which determines uh, who the premier is. And as just noted, uh, that, that role is really one that is determined by the party, not by the voters. So if the premier loses confidence of his own caucus or her own caucus, uh, then ultimately uh, they can be, you know, essentially forced to step down and the party would choose a new premier who ultimately would potentially have to go face an election uh, as leader of the party in front of all the voters. And the voters could then weigh mm -hmm. in about whether they thought the party made a good decision in changing, in changing their premier. Now, that doesn't happen regularly. Um, usually there is a lot of uh, confidence within the party of the premier to mm -hmm. uh, you know, carry the load for as long as their term uh, sub uh, persists. But as just noted, premiers can choose to step down and they can choose to retire even if uh, the caucus isn't calling for it. And then the caucus must make the decision about who uh, the next premier uh, will be so long as they form government. Mm -hmm. and, and then we have cabinet ministers, which it's actually changed a couple of times with this current government. I was there for both cabinet shuffles. Um, and so there's the ministers are MPPs selected by the premier to form what's known as executive council or cabinet. They, they each lead a ministry. So currently in Ontario, we have 24 cabinet ministers, which includes the premier, as well as five associate ministers. So the associate ministers are a bit different because they technically report into a senior minister. So you have the associate minister for transportation who reports into the minister, who technically, technically I say reports with quotations into the, the senior minister, but they still do have a lot of autonomy to, to make decisions and bring policies forward. Um, like we said, the premier can change the number of ministers, the ministry is, as well as who those ministers are, frankly, whenever they want. Um, the cabinet um, will make decisions about government policies and priorities, including provincial budget. So I think we've seen this, you know, with COVID, I think it's a good example. The chief medical officer brings, you know, recommendations each week on, you know, the status of if people are in lockdown, what, what zone they're in, um, and then cabinet ultimately will take that advice and make a, make a decision. Um, cabinet min ministers also introduce legislation um, and govern what's known as government legislation. And, and like we said, like in this, um, in this uh, current government, there was a small shuffle just four months after um, or six months after the government had uh, really got, had been elected. And then, um, and then that follow a year after the government, had, around a year after the government had been elected, they had another cabinet shuffle. So um, really it's up to the premier and just focusing on the priorities of the government. And if he wants to, he or she wants to change the, their cabinet. And then finally, before I pass it on to Devin, we, um, there's also ministries. So Ontario, like we said, they have 20, 24 ministers and there's currently 24 ministries. So ministries are the bureaucratic sector of government led by ministers. Um, each is responsible for a different area of policy, governance, um, what there, it's all, the entire, you know, Government of Ontario Ministries is known as the Ontario Public Service. Um, so on, on the bureaucratic side, there's a deputy minister that leads the policy development and implementation of you know, their ministry. 
they report into this what's known to the secretary of cabinet um and ministers are organized into divisions they ministries are organized into divisions they're each led by assistant deputy ministers who report into it's it's a very large organizational chart and and they really do the bulk of the initial policy development for you know whether it's legislation or policy changes or regulatory changes the the ministries and really do the bulk of of the the research the policy development they are often involved in stakeholder consultations um, and then bring that advice to the minister's office and what you see if you could just go back to the previous slide Haley, briefly j just looking at that list on the right of the slide uh health long-term care finance education uh, tr colleges and universities transportation uh, and there are quite a number of others I think you get the strong recognition from that, that in terms of those uh, issues that people really think of when they think of their government and their day-to-day -day life, that so much of what we uh, think of as the role of government in our system resides at the provincial level. Um, you know, as much as the, the federal government, the, pre, the prime minister attracts a lot of attention, rightfully so, uh, and certainly your local municipal government has a lot of important roles to play. When you think about those big areas, uh, our healthcare system, our uh, K to 12 education system, our, uh, you know, our community and social services infrastructure, uh, all of our colleges and universities, uh, our highways, our regional rail, so on and so forth. You know, this is all areas of provincial jurisdiction. And so that, that really uh, is the interesting fact that while many people focus a lot on the federal government, you know, the provincial government arguably has the biggest impact on the big things that a government does that in fact affect every person's life here in Ontario. And we, we're really seeing that, as Jess said, in the day-to-day -day experience of COVID-19. So much of those decisions are being made provincially, uh, informed by locally, influenced by decisions federally, but very much uh, a, a, a provincial responsibility. Now, if we just go to the next slide, uh, want to discuss a little bit about uh, three uh, important uh, roles or responsibilities of government that often get used interchangeably and people often don't necessarily understand what the difference of the three are but they have very important differences and those are legislation regulation and policy so to try to break this down, legislation speaks about laws. It's a law or a set of laws that have been passed by the government. Uh, the word is also used to describe the act of making a new law. So legislation, think law. Regulation you know, is, is essentially a rule that's created under the authority of a statute or act. And when we say statute or act, that means legislation or law. Regulations are really the instructions uh, to ensure that the intended implementation, interpretation, enforcement, or administration of a law are carried out. Um, this, this is really the uh, taking a law and turning it into uh, the, the various specific powers. It makes it possible for the government to provide additional rules or procedures without having to go ahead and make new laws. So oftentimes legislation will create the broad framework, uh, set out the core principles uh, of what the law, the legislation, the law is trying to achieve. And then the regulation will really set out the specific rules, requir requirements, responsibilities, limits uh, of implementing that law. And then finally, there's policy. And policy is a tremendous amount of the work that, that the government does. And really policy is the statement of intent. It's implemented as procedures or protocols. Uh, basically within the structure of the legislation or the regulations they're under, there's a lot of space for the ministries of government to uh, basically create policy to make these happen. And these policies and plans are, are basically how uh, the government's action is guided. So basically that, that, and what's interesting in this, and we, we can likely explain this a little bit better for you in another session, is the relative complexity of making changes 
is the inverse of this list, that policy requires relatively little effort to change from the government in terms of formal steps. There are internal approvals. The government has to have the will, the political will to make the change, or the ministry has the will to make a change. But the formal steps to change policy are relatively straightforward. Regulation is more formal. It requires some further formal steps, some further uh, formal consultation, but it is still relatively uh, straightforward to change compared to legislation, which is the most formal. The legislation is the only one of these three that has to go in front of all the members of the legislature, those 124 MPPs, for a vote. Uh, so that is the most complicated, the most high profile area to make change, and one where the opposition has the most direct ability to shape and impact and uh, comment on it. And going to the next slide, want to then also give you a bit of context on uh, legislation more specifically, and two different types of legislation that you may hear about. And these are the legislation, in, in, when, I, when we speak of legislation as uh, an act of making a new law. To make a new law, there has to be a bill introduced in front of the legislature, which will go through uh, a series of procedures and readings and consideration before it's ultimately voted on. And there's two types of bills. There's a government bill, and that's very simply, it's a bill that's introduced in the legislature that's sponsored or initiated by a cabinet minister. And functionally, that is a bill that the government, led by the premier, has introduced to set out a change that they, ha are, that they are leading. Uh, these also, I should say, in a majority government like we have now, uh, typically move quite a bit more quickly because they have the, the force of the government's support. And because it's a majority government, they have a lot of control about the timing of these bills, when they go up for debate, when they're prioritized, and ultimately uh, when they're brought forward for a vote. So they can move quite quickly in a majority government if, the, if they are a government bill that the government has prioritized. However, uh, an absolute majority, I would, su I would suggest, of the bills in front of the legislature at any given time are actually private members bills. Now these uh, are actually initiated by any member of the legislature. There are rules about when they can go up for votes. Uh, they often have a much lower uh, rate of being passed because many of them are actually introduced by the opposition. Uh, and in often cases they're introduced by the opposition as a means to draw attention to an issue that's critical of the government. But members of the government caucus, at least the members of the government caucus who are not ministers, uh, can bring forward their own private members bills as well. And these uh, are much more likely, um, uh, they're, they're much more likely to uh, see ultimately uh, to see success in terms of being passed into law. Uh, because the, the private members bills from government members have the advantage of being from members of the government party. Uh, they have the opportunity to talk with the premier, with other members of the premier's office staff, and with the, their fellow colleagues in the caucus to find support for, for passing that bill. Uh, there's one important uh, distinction about a private member's bill is that it cannot propose the expenditure of any public funds. So you cannot include a funding request or commitment for funding within a private member's bill. Those can only be done uh, through a government bill. Uh, because it would have to be introduced by a minister. So although there's these two different types of bills, they often will uh, go through very different paths. The private members bills, there's a lot more of them. They take a lot longer to be passed. And the ones that are passed are most likely those championed by members of the government caucus, which right now is the PC party caucus. Uh, so once again, we'll take a break here briefly if there are any questions uh, that anyone has, uh, because we're happy to answer them, because I know we've just given you a lot of new information. Hi, I have a question here. So um, my question is, since the uh, progressive conservatives, uh, which are now in power, are more concerned about um, businesses and managing the budget. Um, what would you say is the um, will be the the most effective way to engage them in terms of to leverage 
them in terms of SCAGO? Is it, do we leverage the opposition parties? Would they be more effective with pushing our issues forward? Um, would we have to push for maybe having a member of the opposition uh, pushing a private member's bill? Like, which would be the most effective way to push our, our, our agenda forward? I can. Um, so it's a, it's a great question. Um, the government definitely, to your point, um, is focused on support for businesses and the budget, but they do, um, they have in the last two years brought forward policy that is maybe uh, the, like more like health related policy um, and community and social services. Recently, they've, they've made some announcements on on that front. So I think there, there is still a desire to bring those issues forward. Our recommendation would actually be if from a private member's perspective, private member's bill perspective, would be to have the, a government MPP who isn't in cabinet bring forward the private member's bill. Um, they could be, be become the champion around the caucus table within government as well as um, with with cabinet ministers, the bill your bill relates to, they can talk to the minister of health. And often, what happens is when a government MPP will bring forward, um, a, like when a PC MPP, for example, will bring forward um, legislation, the government can often take that private member's bill and wrap it into another government bill if they like the idea. So the opposition is definitely there to help bring raise awareness on issues and there's you definitely should be re relationship building with them but i think um to see movement on a bill on an issue um i would say we would recommend going to a government mpp who can who can champion that for you yeah i, I would say that you know if it were an issue that you were trying to prevent government action um you know, using the opposition to, uh, you know, sort of uh, as, a, as a siren to sort of raise attention in the broader public about the threat uh, might be more effective. I think when you're trying to achieve positive uh, change within government, it is more effective to find those champions within government. And I would like to suggest, um, and you know, I say this as a liberal, who, <laughs> so you can, you can take my word for it. Um, I think there's a bit of a popular misconception, at least for those people who understandably, most people in the public don't have the opportunity to interact with individual MPPs uh, mm -hmm. in government the way that we do. I think within this PC caucus, there is a lot of, as much as they are very focused and interested in helping small businesses and helping uh, um, you know, deal with issues of excessive regulation, of trying to ha be, have a, a fiscal discipline, although COVID made that very difficult. As you <laughs> There is also a lot of empathy and mm -hmm. interest in um, issues of positive social good. They may not mm -hmm. all be the same as what were the priorities under the Liberal government or were the priorities of perhaps the NDP opposition. But I think particularly on issues about groups dealing with um, uh, challenges that are of no fault of their own, I think you will find there is a lot more support and uh, mm -hmm. empathy than you might expect, uh, yes. particularly for issues where it's people living with, you know, we do a lot of work with individuals uh, living with developmental disabilities. And there's a lot of positive support for those individuals because while totally different from individuals living with sickle cell anemia, it, it, nobody made a decision that led them to this challenge. They, it was something mm -hmm. they were born with. It's, you know, and I think you will find there is a lot of interest in trying to, to help communities who need that extra help, um, whether that's in, you know, their inter interface with the healthcare system, their interface with the education system, whatever else it is, uh, particularly where there is, there's no political angle to it, right? You know what I yeah. mean? Like it's not, it shouldn't be an issue that's political. You know, individuals living with sickle cell anemia should not be a political issue. And you don't want to politicize an issue that should have everyone supportive of it. Yeah. Challenge. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. You're absolutely right. There's a lot of empathy for these sorts of issues with, within the current this current government. And I think another thing that is worth noting um, is that uh, while perhaps not reflected necessarily in the faces of cabinet, um, I think that this PC party 
um, is very conscious of the fact that they are a party with a multicultural base and that their majority government was uh, because they convinced many multicultural voters that they cared about the issues that mattered to them. And many of those issues were related to small business and to the cost of living. But they know there's also a lot of issues that affect members of those communities that are very different that might affect uh, their voters in rural Ontario, for example, um, who, who are, you know, uh, more of, of the uh, white cultural communities. So I think there are a lot of members, a lot of staff, and a lot of people within government who recognize the fact that they, uh, that they are speaking to a diverse coalition of voters, and they're interested in making sure that they are respecting the issues that matter to those voters. I think sometimes that will shape how you will talk about something, because the language might be a little bit different than if you were talking with the opposition NDP, but I don't think it necessarily means that the interest in dealing with the issue is any different. So that's why the advocacy is always a nuanced piece. So I think we'll just want to get uh, uh, keep moving here in the interest of time because I will want to take you through some important information here about how to put your advocacy into action. Uh, and there's a lot of information here. So I think we'll try to discuss this relatively quickly uh, because we do have a quiz to try to make this a little practical. Uh, but uh, we'll be, of course, recording this presentation, as you know, and, and you can always refer back to this because a lot of this will be good information uh, for going forward. So in terms of, of the first question, you need to define your ask. Uh, you have to consider an effective advocacy is knowing what you want and being realistic in your expectations. So you want to consider um, what's your top priority. You can't have a million priorities. You have to really focus in on what the top priority is because government only has so much time and attention to deal with certain issues. What's the context around, around the situation? That means, you know, what's the political climate right now? Uh, are there current events that are going to take the attention away from the government or help bring your issue to the forefront? How can you find uh, the context that helps your issue? For example, uh, Lonry has certainly talked with us a lot a bit about how COVID has uh, impacted uh, those living with sickle cell. Uh, the economy, of course, is going to be a major piece of context for any political party. And what are the other actions they're working on? Or what are the actions the opposition are taking that the government may want to contrast with? And then, of course, as we've talked at the beginning, who's your audience? What's the party in power? What are their priorities? How does this impact their constituents? What, what is this going to look like for the people that they know are who have voted for them and will they'll be hoping will vote for them again in the future? And if it's not, uh, you know, if it's a non-governmental audience, what's the main mandate of the organization you're speaking with and how is this either going to benefit or impact them? And then looking at at your advocacy strategy, because ultimately you're going to have to create a strategy for any advocacy effort you want to undertake, but it's going to be aided by having really strong relationships uh, with all these key people across government. You know, that's going to be your elected officials, ministers and MPPs, the political staff who work for them, but also, of course, the civil servants, the, the career civil servants who work for the ministries. As we've said from the beginning, don't focus only on the minister. Uh, that is a, a good way to potentially hit a dead end because ministers in many cases are dealing with so many priorities, they're going to only act um, in some cases by hearing from a chorus of voices. So that's the MPPs, that's the staff members in their office, that's the ministries directly involved, but also ministries that might tangentially be involved. Uh, for example, uh, children, community, and social services, not primarily focused on issues affecting sickle cell, but maybe there are connections there that, that would be influential. And how does that minister and that ministry help shape things? Uh, as we say, you've got to meet with all these different groups, find these opportunities to talk to as many people who may be influential as possible, because you don't know who your champion may ultimately end up being. And these issues often do need a champion. And you do want to think about your long-term relationships. As we've said, there's a lot of change within government. It never stops. Uh, and one of the ways to make, you know, to think about long-term relationships is building as many of those local relationships as possible because you don't know which MPP is suddenly going to be uh, uh, appointed as a minister in a key portfolio, maybe as a parliamentary assistant, which is sort of a, a, a secondary uh, role to the minister in the legislature, but has an influential relationship. Uh, and also within the bureaucracy, within the ministries, creating those deep relationships with those career civil servants, many of which 
will be in certain roles for many years. Uh, so making sure that your issues have knowledge and have advocates within government beyond any given year or election cycle. And then the next slide, you'll see that there's an important effort to build a network of support. Um, you know, when you're talking about your, your conversation with government, it, it cannot, sometimes it's not only going to be yourself directly with government, it may be yourself working through other groups, other groups that can have uh, common interests, uh, that may be talking about their support for the same issue so in the ways that benefit their organization. You know, that could be private sector companies. You know, you may find that you're working with pharmaceutical companies or gene therapy companies, biotech companies, for example, that may be doing work in the area of uh, the health issue that, that uh, you're dealing with, which of course, in your case is sickle cell. Uh, that may be other patient groups. Um, are there issues related to um, other, uh, uh, you know, other, uh, if not only sickle cell, but other uh, uh, rare disorders or uh, blood disorders, uh, blood conditions? Um, working with thalassemia is a great example where there's common interest. And of course, other nonprofit organizations, uh, they may not only be related to health issues, but to, could be to community groups as well groups that represent uh, members of the community who are particularly at risk of, of, um, of, a, of a certain health uh, issue or of, uh, of um, living with certain health conditions. You may find some real common purpose there, which can bring a new uh, perspective to the issue in your conversations with government. Ultimately, if we go to the next slide, uh, you're, you're going to have to ultimately take your expansive understanding of this issue and all the ins and outs and all the issues that you're aware of and really find a way to distill that down as concisely as possible. And that's really about creating effective materials. And, and usually for an organization such as yourself, this is gonna be synthesized into what we call a briefing note or a briefing deck. That's a PowerPoint presentation like this that's not used in a presentation context. But really, this is going to be about drilling that down to the most, you know, simplified uh, way possible that still gives them the critical information they need, but also thinks about those priorities and interests of the government and how they align. Because your deck or note are really going to set the narrative about how the ministry, the minister's office and others will see this issue. Uh, you're going to want to be concise, as I said, and you want to going to do your homework. And when I say homework, that's, I mean, thinking about uh, what are the government's priorities? What other actions have they taken? Uh, are there issues or, or um, considerations around the matter you're bringing to their attention that have been in the media recently? How, how do we make sure that this connects with things that matter to them? And either they see an opportunity, uh, they see or, or a way to per perhaps prevent a negative outcome that they would be concerned about. And you always want to make sure that you have got these as polished and finalized as possible because you'll want to be sharing them with everyone you're engaging with, but also sending it to them in advance so that they have enough time to review that, to read your information, and hopefully have some good questions for when you're having a chance to speak with them uh, in a meeting or in a virtual call like this. There's some really important do's and don'ts around creating materials as well. Uh, these, I would say, are fairly hard and fast rules that I think you would be well served to always ask yourself when preparing any kind of material to share uh, in a meeting or in a prior to a call. You know, think about presenting your information like telling a story. It should have a beginning, a middle, and end. What is that? Uh, what is that? That story you want to tell? I'm not suggesting you want to write up a long anecdote, but it should have a very step-by-step -step kind of structure. Uh, oftentimes, actually, perhaps a little bit uh, conversely, you may want to lead with what your ask is and then tell the story about why it matters. You also want to anticipate as much as you can the issues and the questions that you think the audience you're speaking with is going to raise and try to proactively address them. Uh, as much as possible, try to think where they're going to go and have the answer ready for them in a way that's going to help um, amplify your advocacy. As I said a few times now, and I don't think I could say it enough, you want to simplify it. You want to make complex material digestible. You don't want to have a lot of acronyms in there without context. 
the challenge you're always going to face is you will always know more about your issue uh, than they ever will. So you need to find that place to meet in the middle where they're going to be able to grasp and feel activated to work on your issue after that first conversation. Because if you don't win them over on some level in that first conversation, you aren't necessarily going to get another one. They may not know everything they need to know that first conversation, but they should know what they really need to understand to be able to continue working with you. And then don't assume, do not assume at any point that your audience is going to be knowledgeable about the topic you discuss. They may never have heard of it before. So you need to take them back to a very basic level, but do it in such a way that it doesn't overwhelm the meeting. You need to be able to synthesize that down to a simplified uh, piece of context without uh, taking too much time away to then use your materials to get into the main issue uh, that you're focused on. Now, ultimately, these, these are all going to be used uh, in support of conduct, conducting meetings with your various audiences, whether it's a minister, minister's office staff, MPPs, ministry officials, and so forth. And you want to make sure that those meetings are as effective as possible. And these rules are pretty consistent. And for many of uh, the folks here, the meetings that you might be most involved with would be meetings with your local MPP. So these are good rules to follow. You really want to try to stick to the point. And by that, I mean, stick to your key ask, the messages that are in your briefing materials and try to stay off going on tangents, unless it's to provide some, you know, powerful local context. Um, you want to do your homework. You want to appeal to the politician or the audience's larger goals. Um, that may be the government's goals as a whole. It may be issues that are particularly personally relevant uh, to that member. So you want to do your research. You want to be concise. Uh, you may ultimately only have 15 to 30 minutes uh, for a meeting, uh, particularly with a minister. You may have more with a local MPP, but don't assume that you're going to have, uh, you know, an uninterrupted amount of time. Uh, they have a lot of other demands on their time. You want to try and focus that in. You do want to find opportunities to give them examples and data so that they understand the impact of the issues you're dealing with. Uh, and you do, wherever possible, want to try to find that local angle especially in those meetings with MPPs. How does this matter in the local community? What's the impact going to be in your own, uh, in your own region where, where they represent? You know, at the same time, it's, it's a good idea not to fake an answer. It, in fact, it's often quite useful that if they ask a question that you don't have an answer to, uh, that you can take that away and say that you'll follow up with them with more information. It also keeps the conversation going. Uh, so it's a great way to make sure that there is a follow-up conversation, that if there's something they ask that you are not 100% sure of, that you come back to them with it. Take lots of notes. Make sure you understand the questions they've asked, the areas where they've shown support, so that you can, um, you can take that learning back and think about how it'll help shape your conversation going forward. You might also learn some really important information about the government's priorities, that member's priorities, that might help think of, you think about what your strategy will be going forward. And of course, you want to make sure they've got a copy of your materials and they've got a copy of your contact information so that you can keep the conversation going with them, with the members of their staff, with their other colleagues, whoever else is going to be important. Thinking about your conversation as a whole, there's really probably three things that especially the folks that are joining us today want to be thinking about. Number one, your local experience. You are the proof point to the problem or the solution that you're advocating for. This part of the story, you want to make sure it's going to be very personal. This is about you. This is about your family, your colleagues, your neighbors, uh, your local community. At the same time, you want the provincial context. What's the bigger picture here? Is, it, is, is your situation part of a growing or province-wide problem, an issue that is faced in other communities? You know, this is where you want to bring the facts and the numbers to play. You want to really show what the, the breadth of the problem is. And then on your ask, what, do you, what are you asking them to do? What action are you asking them to take? And as much as possible, you want to be very clear about that. Be clear about your priorities. Be clear about your ask. And as we go back to what we talked about at the, at the beginning of this section, you know, hopefully your ask is something that is realistic, that they can help achieve. And in some cases, it may not be them making the decision but it may be them speaking to the individuals in support uh, who have the power to make that decision. And of course, follow-up is going to be very important. 
You need to keep the, go the dialogue going. You want to stay in touch. Uh, one meeting will not solve your issue with anyone. You want to find that opportunity to keep talking. You may not get a lot of opportunities to talk with a minister, but you should have opportunities to continue talking with their staff and with local MPPs, with members of the ministry that you're, that you're advocating with. You should have a lot more opportunity to have a, a dialogue that continues. You want to follow up actively. Send that thank you email, set, set thank you letter, follow up with information you were willing to share, and be thankful for the opportunity uh, to, to engage with them and remind them about actions that they agreed to take and the key points of what you brought forward. And you need to find those opportunities to, to reconnect. They may not all be formal meetings, you know, especially in the post COVID time, there will be opportunities to uh, engage in, in the, locally in the community at events that the, the MPP is holding, for example. Some of those may make a lot of sense to, uh, to uh, have uh, you take part in, to participate in. You may also find opportunities to invite the local member to come to where you and the patients living with sickle cell uh, are. You know, if that's a clinic in the community, that may be an opportunity. It may also just be meeting with uh, local uh, members of the community who live with sickle cell to better understand uh, how they can help and the issues that you're, you're, uh, you are facing and advocating for. So we did say um, that we have some time here for questions. Uh, and I think we, we do want to have some time for questions. So if you, if you do have any, please write them in the chat box. But I think very quickly, uh, we did prepare a little quiz to sort of very briefly show you how uh, functionally what we just talked about really plays out in practice. And so it should only take uh, about five minutes or so, uh, but we want to just take you through this very quickly. Um, and feel free uh, to just use the chat box at, at the side to give us your answer. And we will go quickly. We will not wait too long uh, for answers because we, we want to make sure we have time uh, for any remaining questions. So with that, Haley, uh, feel free to kick us off. Yes, thank you. So we're just going to do a little um, pop quiz, I guess you could call it. And um, if you would, I'm going to read the scenario out and then I'll read all the questions. And if you either want to, like Devin said, put your answer in the chat or just make a little note of it and um, maybe make a note of the answer once we tell you, um, that would be helpful for the future, I think. So the scenario, um, the Work-Life Balance Initiative is an organization fighting for the destigmatization of working from home. In the reality of 2020, with most office workers stationed at home, the coalition is finding time to focus on government rules that restrict public employees from working from home. Our job is to develop an eight step plan to help them engage government and reach their goals. What do we suggest? So for the first step, what's the first thing we need to do? There are three options. A, decide what your primary ask will be and manage your expectations. B, create your engagement team and C, buy branded clothing from the political party currently forming government. So I'll give you all uh, a couple of seconds, not too long though. And um, okay. So looks like everybody who typed in the chat got it right. Decide what your primary ask will be and manage your expectations. It's very important to stick to, like Devin said, something realistic that they can help you with. Yeah, and very and very quickly there, uh, you know, B is very important too about figuring out who your engagement team is going to be and how you're going to take part in things. But it really does flow from what your primary ask will be and trying to set that out first. That's really got to be not step number one. Okay, step two, the CWC has decided to pursue engagement. I'm going to turn off that little Siri that keeps showing up on my <laughs> screen. Don't know if you can see that. Um, to pursue engagement with the provincial government to introduce work from home Wednesdays in Queen's Parks, Service Ontario, and constituency offices. The next step is to call the Premier's personal phone number. He's very well known for handing that around. Um, analyze the current political environment and the government's capacity to act on your ask and schedule a protest outside of Queen's Park and make banners stating your ask. Been a lot of people doing that in the pandemic too. Looks like everybody here is doing pretty well. Analyze the current political environment and the government's capacity to act on your ask. Jess, do you want to say something? No, I was going to say, I mean, the, the premier often does, he has in the past given out his cell phone number for, uh, you know, at um, 
whether it's com rallies or conferences or or whatnot, but you definitely want to take the formal road and um, and you know analyze the current political environment and um, the government's capacity. Step three, creating a window of opportunity. So A is determine your audience. Who are the key players you will who will weigh in on this decision or inform those who will or have personal interest in the issue? Are any MPPs who would have a personal, are there any MPPs who would have a personal interest in your cause? B, have everyone in your organization call the Ministry of Labor. And C, get a petition going to be signed by public employees. So the answer is once again, A, determine your audience. This is a very important step and it will help you um, develop your, your information briefs and determine next steps. Devin and Jess, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah. B and C are both tactics that in certain circumstances you may determine uh, is important for, uh, for your issue. But until you've really thought about your audience, either B or C could be a terrible decision uh, for this particular uh, uh, objective, depending on uh, the current situation and whether there might be more effective ways to get something done. The next step, step four, is before the meeting request. You can either A, prepare posters and emails declaring victory on your issue, make a compelling video to be shown for the first time at your meeting with government, or create a briefing note and provide the note to the Office of Government Officials well in advance of scheduled meetings. Once again, everybody's doing pretty well. The answer is C, create a briefing note and provide it well in advance. It's important to give the government officials time to get a little bit of information. It'll save you time during your meeting. And um, it's just, I, I think out of these three, probably the most professional and effective option. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's also important to think about resources. Videos are great. They can be an mm -hmm. incredibly effective way to uh, get people uh, to pay attention to your issue. But there's a tremendous amount of money, time and resources involved and you can accomplish a great deal and perhaps your best first step really focusing on what's that very simple briefing note that really tells what they need to know at a moment's notice about this issue. Exactly. Step five, asking for a meeting. There are three options again. A, show up in person to the government's offices of MPPs you think would be interested. B, contact offices of MPPs and or ministers who are an who your analysis concludes may have interest and politely follow up until the meeting is confirmed. And C, send daily requests for a meeting and follow up with angry phone calls. It's nice to know everybody's been paying attention. The answer is B once again. I, I will um, certainly tell you and, uh, you know, Haley <laughs> having worked in a constituency office has seen this from a different <laughs> perspective, uh, but Jess and I have seen it from a minister's office perspective too you would uh, be surprised at how many yep. people undertake option A or C. Um, yep. Much less effective than option B. <laughs> yeah, I, will yeah, say, I was gonna say the same thing. <laughs> when I was working in my MPP's office, she wasn't re seeking re-election and people would call and say, I'm not gonna vote for her. And they said, we don't want you to, she's not seeking re-election. <laughs> so it wasn't very effective. Um, getting ready for a meeting is step six. You can A, prepare a small team to attend the meeting, research the official or officials you are meeting with, and practice how you'll, be, how you'll position your cause in a light that will be beneficial to the office, officials' constituents. B, wing it. Your points will be more passionate if they aren't being read from a briefing note. Or C, go alone and bring props. Everybody's doing pretty well. Um, the answer is A, prepare a small team to attend the meeting, research the official or officials, and practice bringing it to a local light for them. And again, B and C are all mm -hmm. commonly seen. And so it is really important to, uh, to do that work ahead of time to be prepared and be professional. Absolutely. Step seven, the meeting. Stay focused on your key ask of the meeting or meetings. Bring extra copies of your briefing note and thank them for their time. B, start with your first ask and then discuss everything else you'd like to see for the cause. If they seem nice, ask for funding. 
And C, suggest moving the meeting to a bar or coffee shop close to their office to keep everybody relaxed. Answer is once again, A, stay focused on your ask. It's very important. They're very busy people and keeping things realistic will be more, much more effective, bringing extra copies of your note and being very thankful for their time. It, it may be worth noting very briefly here that, that sometimes you may encounter in a meeting an MPP um, that may push you, for example, on things they might wanna do or other opportunities they may think of, new priorities you hadn't thought of. I think you should always take a breath in those situations and really, you know, be very positive towards their support, but best not to uh, deviate from your key ask on the fly. Take that information back to the rest of your team uh, and let, let them think about it strategically and, and try to determine, is there another opportunity here we should think about, or is this a distraction from what we really need to focus on? And once we've done this, we can take them up on that other opportunity going forward or spend some time working on that as a side issue. Yeah. Cool. And, and I would say for, for C, you know, there are times where, you know, going with one of the staff members to minister's office for coffee would make sense, but for the formal meetings where you want to bring a briefing note, where you want to have a bit of a team there, definitely um, go with A. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the last step after the meeting. So there's three options. You can not follow up because you don't want to bug them. You can wait and see if there's no progress in the next month. It is time to go to war with government, as people say, with protests, petitions, and press releases. Or C, follow up with a thank you, provide any information you promised in the meeting, and express interest in continuing to communicate on the matter. Not very surprised everybody got this one right, since you've all been doing pretty well. Um, the answer is follow up with a thank you, provide any of that extra information and express interest in keeping communications. You would be perhaps surprised at how many people have that one meeting with a minister, with an MPP, and it is a good meeting and it's an effective meeting and they never really follow up. And the expectation is, is that they told the minister, the MPP, everything they needed to know and they didn't do anything. Um, but this is, a, this is a constant effort. Your advocacy will require that, that ongoing conversation, uh, that follow-up that aren't badgering them, but are you know, consistent, that you are you know, respectfully staying in their ear about the issue and how you can work in practical ways to move it forward. So taking any of those um, steps they, they may have suggested, next steps, and, and pursuing the action that was, that was committed to. Yes, I think what's interesting about all of these steps in this activity is um, some of these answers you might be thinking, well, that's obviously not the one, but the funny thing is these do happen. So it's it's good to, good to know the right way to go. Uh, so once again, we're gonna go to questions if anybody has any. Yeah, and we'll be conscientious of time as I know there was uh, some things uh, at the end that, that Lonry wanted to conclude with, but we probably have time for, for maybe one more question if, if anybody has anything they wanted to raise. Um, quick question. So I saw that in the quiz, there was a lot of um, suggestion for options, uh, well, for options suggesting, you know, protests and petitions. In which circumstances that uh, will protesting and signing petitions will be effective? It's, that's a good question. Um, I think if you're not seeing, there will be a time that if you're not seeing progress on an issue, um, you may have to take a more aggressive route and maybe schedule a protest or um, get petitions going um, to start getting it you know, more awareness and traction on the issue. But definitely um, it would be when, frankly, you think that the, the answer is no from the, the government of the day. And um, yeah, I don't know, Devin, if you have anything else yeah, to add. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. If you really and truly feel like there is no opportunity for progress with the government. And I would also say that that would have to be if you felt there was really no progress on any of your issues with the government because perhaps they won't be willing to work on one issue, but they might be very interested mm -hmm. in working on another one. Um, that at that point, you do have some of those options and tactics you can consider. And I think there is an escalation involved that you need to think about. You know, For example, a petition brought forward by a, 
an opposition member is a fairly low impact uh, way to voice uh, concern about an issue. Um, you know, it's not going to ruffle a lot of feathers necessarily. Um, perhaps it, there's going to be involved going to media with a story that isn't necessarily attacking the government, but is raising the plight of the issue and how either a, a decision of government has made something worse or would make something worse or just the absence of action has made something bad. Um, but that would again be when you really felt the government wasn't going to take a proactive effort to try to deal with this issue. Um, protests, of course, are going to be the most in your face. Um, there's certainly many issues, a time and a place for this, uh, and, but it has to be a carefully considered choice because regardless of the government of the day, uh, any party, this would be the same. Uh, you know, when you start to undertake the protest route, you kind of are burning your bridge mm -hmm. to, to get anything done constructively and in partnership. And government's almost always going to want to act uh, in a positive way. If your sole objective is to stop a very a decision that you see as very bad, then and the government isn't listening, then protest may be your your only real option uh, available. Uh, and it is easier, perhaps, if success is being determined by saying stop the government from doing something, then maybe protest is effective and worth it. If if the protest is about government getting the government to spend money, for example. Uh, you might find that that has a lot less uh, chance of success because you're trying to convince the government to take a positive action through a negative uh, tactic, you know, a negative tactic to make a decision seem worse than it's worth um, may ultimately be more successful. But at the core of it, it's got to be a very strategic choice. You know, everybody involved with the government relations effort needs to come together, really weigh the pros and cons and decide are certain tactics uh, going to help or are they going to be more harmful? So that, that collaborative effort is why it's, I think, particularly important to figure out when best to take these steps. Okay, thank you so much. Well, with that, uh, I, I think we'd love to, we thank you all for, for the time here. And of course, if there are more questions, you know, absolutely to share them by email with Laundry and we'll be happy to provide some more context. But I wanna make sure uh, that on behalf of all of us, we, we thank you for mm -hmm. the time uh, that you shared with us this morning and to uh, pass it back to Laundry to, uh, to wrap things up. Well, thank you, Devan. Thank you, Jace and Ailey. I think um, most people on this call today will, um, will agree that we have learned quite a lot. Um, looking at the quiz that you provided, um, it reminds me of when we do those action day at Parliament Hill or even at Queen's Park, how we have to prepare the decks and organize meetings with the MPP. So thank you so much for the training today. So team, I know that we're a little bit late. It's about one minute late right now. Um, we have a poll. If you can kindly please uh, complete this poll, which I will launch now, um, that would be helpful. I also want to add that um, if you, so that we have, I believe four questions or five questions. Um, we want to know if the advocacy training um, meet your expectation today. Um, can you see the poll? Okay, wonderful, I can see. Okay, did you learn something new and useful? You have your choices. Was the training deliv delivery well coordinated? Has this training provided you with some skill sets to support Skagos advocacy initiatives? And would you want to attend the next advocacy training of the Skago? And if you want to, we would like you to please go back in the chat box when you finish this poll and provide your name and we can have you on her list of those that will like to be invited to the next advocacy training. We'll give you about two more minutes for the poll. Thank you very much. Somebody give thumbs up, thank you. <laughs>